Um, listen, get your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 3. Uh, that's where you're going to want to be. So I don't, I'm, I'm confident that you can't tell, right? I'll step out here and let you look for a second. I have lost 19 pounds. <laughs> Or at least I had before I ate that brownie this morning. Thanks, Murtis. So it's probably like 15 at this point. But um, you see it back here? Yeah. It's in my back pocket, right? Uh, so, I mean, one part of that is, you know, trying to go to the gym, do a little workout, doing some Pilates in the back room, whatever. Uh, but I don't know if y'all have ever heard the, the phrase to never skip leg day, right? If you've done any gym work at all, like there's kind of that rule about it that you never skip leg day. And I actually hate that rule because... You think about what you care about. Like what I want is for this to flatten out, right? Get a little thicker. I want these to get bigger and have some form of form and shape. They're not just sticks coming out the side. I don't really care what my legs look like. I really don't. I've got good looking calves because I was a football player and you're never going to see me in anything shorter than just seeing my calves. So nothing else down there matters. And that's why we have the rule of never skipping leg day. Because you think, if I go to the gym and I'm doing all this stuff and working all this stuff, one, I'm going to end up looking like this weird-shaped beast on top with bird legs underneath, right? (laughs) And that just looks stupid. I've seen guys that look that way. But two, like, there's a reality behind it is that these muscles are fun and cool. But these muscles down here is where everything happens, right? What if you didn't have leg muscles or your hips quit working right, right? Or your knees get worn out and you can't walk, right? You can't do anything else. Like that is its core, its foundation. That's why we talk about you never skip leg dates because everything else is fun, but that is the foundation to everything else. And I'm telling you all that just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to do today and tomorrow. So like every week we come in here, we're obviously studying scripture and I don't think any of it's unimportant, right? Like we're We're doing good work on it, but some of it's like fun. Some of it's like sculpting, making us look good or get better at what we're trying to do, whatever. Every now and then we got to come back and do leg day. And that's what today and tomorrow and next week is going to be is we're going to be in Romans chapter three for two weeks. I mean, yeah, two weeks in a row doing like heavy doctrinal work on the doctrine of sin today and the doctrine of atonement tomorrow, right? So just every now and then, you and I have to come back into the gym, which is actually not an inappropriate way to view Sunday morning, right? Your work is out there. That's where you live. That's where missions happens. We come in here to build a little strength, catch our breath, and be ready to go back to it tomorrow, right? So we're going to spend leg day today and tomorrow and see if we can't really fill up ourselves with some basic depth of doctrine that will then feed into everything else we do. So our our thoughts are going to be anchored in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, just two, which is weird for me. So I'll tell you what in reality what we're doing is kind of pulling on the larger thought that Paul has from Romans 3 and 5, chapters 3 through 5. So if you want to read that later, kind of as your homework, knock yourself out, right? But we're going to zero in in Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned, And fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Today we're going to focus on that first part that all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And we have to think about what sin is, right? And that's really what we're doing today is to define what sin is. And here's what's going to be interesting. Not sin, you've heard me talk about this before. Like we have church words, right? And actually grace is one of them. We'll deal with that next week. There are words that you and I use, we sing about, we talk about, and we have concept and understand and meaning for them. But I would bet you would really struggle to define it. Which means that when you interact with someone on the mission field, when you interact with your neighbor and you want to talk to them about what it means to be sinful and what it means to need grace, you struggle to get the words out of your mouth because you've never actually like, developed a definition of what it means. So I want you to stop and think for a second what sin means. If you have a piece of paper, take the chance and write now. Like, this is what I would define sin to be because we assume that we know what sin is. But I wonder if we would struggle to define it or to explain it. Now, in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, there are a plethora of words to talk about that are used to define or are translated as sin. Some of them are 
they come across like with these kind of translations, like to be bent or to be crooked, to be disobedient, to break the law. That's the more legal concept of it. To revolt and that rebellion, that's the way I, you've heard me say, I like that one. That's the way it works. It makes sense to my brain. A breach of trust, right? That God's entrusted you with something and you somehow breach that. But there's two main words that are used like predominantly. These They carry the the, the, the bulk of the theology from Scripture. The one from the Old Testament is, is you would call it Chata, C-H-A-T-A. It would probably be your best way to write it out. It's in Hebrew, and no one in this room can read it, me included, all right? So it's just Chata or Chata, something like that, all right? And in the New Testament, the word that would be used to just straight translate that, or it's used in the New Testament, is Hamartima, all right? Or Hamartima, if you want to say it real fancy-like. That's the word we see in Romans 3.23, all right. So in Romans 3, 23, it says all have, and he uses this word that is a verb that also has a noun version, right, of a harmatimos or harmatimia or something along that line. But the point is, is that you take that word and you look at the way it's used throughout the scripture and you want to pull in some ideas of how that Greek word is used in other places. And we start to come up with a very basic definition then of what the New Testament uses to define sin, because that's the word we use most of the time. And the way we would define that word would, would basically mean to be missing the mark, right? That we somehow miss the mark, that we deviate from the norm. And that's, that's the definition we at least want to start with of what sin is. That we miss a mark or an expectation or a norm, that we're somehow off from that in some way. And most times, not every time, but almost every time that word is used, it's usually used in reference to a specific action. So like this is sin, right? This is missing the mark. It's sometimes used in this case, for instance, where it's more of a general, like it's talking about all things. But most of the time it's defining that this was sinful or somebody sinned by doing X. And it helps us kind of pull the idea of that's what sin is and this is what sin is and this is what it looks like. And we get good examples from that. But think about the definition you came up with in your head. Was it anything like missing the mark? I hope so, right? I'm just going to assume that it was. We're all on the same page. The sin is that it's missing the mark, deviating from the norm, not living up to expectations. I learned something at work a couple weeks ago, and I confirmed it with my great colleague up here, Chris, this morning, uh, about how you fly and how important it is to like be on mark. Like what we what we do, it, 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 well, we do. I don't do it. I just make the schedule. Boys do it, right? But we send guys across country. That's one of the things you have to do in order to like graduate from us and go off to do bigger and better things. Is you have to be able to do a cross country fly. So they've got to leave Meridian and go end up like in Reno or something like that and figure out how to do it. Put it together, make your marks and on a map and know how to get there and know that you're going to get there. And it's kind of important because the planes that we're flying at the Navy base don't have radar. So like you basically have a map. There may be some GPS things to back it up, right? But you got to be able to get from point A to point B and land the plane before you run out of fuel. And I learned this from talking to one of the old timers there about how significant it is to be slightly off, off mark. So, like, if you are just one degree, so if you're going to fly this way at 95 degrees, and somehow you set your heading at 96 degrees, you're losing something like 92 feet off of your distance for every mile that you fly. So, for every mile that you fly, and when you're flying at, you know, 350 miles an hour, that happens really fast, you're losing almost 100 feet. And the thought to that is, then say you want to leave New York and you want to go to L.A., right? So, cross, basic cross country, New York to Los Angeles, you're going to be something in the range of 40 to 50 miles off of your target by the time you get there. Which means if you're wanting to land in L.A. and you're one degree to the right, you're actually going to land in the ocean and you're dead. If you want one degree to the left, you're going to be in San Diego. You may still be dead either way, right? But one degree is that big of a difference. The same thing if you go from like San Francisco all the way across to Washington, D.C. One degree off means you're actually going to land in Boston. You're not going to get to where you want. And I want you to think about that. If sin is missing the mark, even by one degree... If it makes it that big of a difference, especially spread out over time, right? A sin is present in your life, a, an action that you continue to live in and dwell in and just let be a part of who you are, that that one degree of offness continues to exponentially grow over time, how far off you are now or how off you will be in five years. And let's be honest, 
Like I'm a pretty, I'm pretty good at most things I do. I tell myself that at least, which means I'm pretty good at sinning too. I don't, I rarely ever sin by just one degree. If I'm going to sin, it's going to be 25 degrees, you know? It's going to be 50 degrees. I'm way over here, like, doing my own thing. And God's like, hey, what are you doing? Stop being stupid. And imagine if, if we define sin in that way, that if sin is missing the mark, that means you're over here. And you see how destructive that is. If this is where I want to be, if I want to be in the presence of God, if I want to live a righteous life, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But if that's where I'm trying to be, and sin literally means just to miss the mark by any form of degree, especially exponentiated over time, I'm nowhere in here where I want to be. And there's really not a whole lot of chance of coming back at that point. If we use the word that Paul uses here in Roman, and again, it's the primary word in the New Testament. So this is our primary definition of what sin is. That sin is to miss the mark or a norm or in whatever the, the normal is. The flip side of that definition means that there is a norm or an expectation that exists. Because if, if we're going to define sin as missing something, that means that there is something there, right, that we're aiming for. There is an aim point. There is a norm or an expectation, or we may want to use a standard, whatever you want to call that. If sin is going this direction by at least one degree, then something here is what we want. Something here is the norm that is expected for your life that God has laid down for you and for me. There is a standard. And the question then is, what is that? How would we define the norm, right? Because sin, actually, it's one of the, it's like a negative argument. Sin defines what it's not. But I want to know what it is. What is the normal expectation on us from God? You think about the way that Paul says it here, and I think there's more work to be done on this one, but I'm just going to throw it out there and let you dwell on it. He says that all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Which means that if, if I'm missing the mark, even by one degree of the glory of God, maybe whatever it is that I'm aiming for, right, is the glory of God. Now, think about what that means, and let that simmer for a moment. I think we're going to come back to it, but obviously it's somehow connected to what the glory of God is. And normally we would use this, and I mean, every preacher I hope that you've ever known has tried to then define what that looks like by some form or word of righteousness, right? The fulfillment of expectations, that's basically what righteousness is. And hint, I'm pulling that from Romans chapter 1. If you were to look in Romans 1 verses 16 and 17, Paul kind of gives us that idea. And somehow those ideas combine to give us the vision of what normal is. The vision of what expectation is. The vision of this is what God has laid out for me. That it is a pursuit of righteousness and a fulfillment of the expectations that he's laid out for me. And that that is somehow then connected to participating in the glory of God. Or if you think all the way back to Genesis, recognizing that our initial duty is to reflect the glory of God. Right? Those are all somehow defining for us the norm. This is what God wants for your life. This is what God has designed for you and for your life. This is what it means to be made in his image. And sin is missing it. Sin is supposed to be walking down the hall and you end up in the closet. It's just being off the mark. To me, it's, that's actually a really big deal. That there is a normal expectation for all of us, that there is a, a primary understanding. And that actually kind of, even in itself, goes against the grain of our cultural idea, right? Everyone's supposed to walk their own path, be their own person. The, the definition of normal almost doesn't exist in our world anymore. So for us to then try to claim that there is some form of normal expectation, we're already kind of butting heads with ideas that exist in the world around us. But we hear that from Scripture, that God has a norm, an expectation, and that clearly whatever this sin is, if sin is by definition missing the mark, that is not a part of God's original plan, right? It's not supposed to be there. So you fill in the blank, whatever your sin is, whatever the sin is you committed this morning, the one that's waiting for you at lunch, right? That gossip that's going to happen as soon as you leave, that sin is not part of the plan that God had for you. It's not designed. It's off by at least one degree. 
So Scripture gives us this definition of what sin is, that we've all done, right? All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, as missing that mark, as deviating from that norm, as not living up to this expectation that God has laid out for you. And don't, don't miss that. God has an expectation for you, and it's really, really good and really, really high. And then in the New Testament, you hear glimpses of this from the Old Testament, but especially in the New Testament, that idea grows. It evolves into a newer theme that refers not just to the action of sin. Remember I told you those words are almost always used in reference to a specific action, right? Like it's a verb, this thing has happened. But it does begin to evolve, especially when you get to like books like Romans and they develop into this concept of a powerful force. This force, this presence that is part now of, of human existence. And not that it hasn't always been, it's just that we were realizing that. God pointed it out to us. We start to see that idea sprinkling up through the New Testament so that sin is the things that you do. But sin also is somehow this, this presence and this force, this inclination that is designed, not designed, but that is part of you in your internals. It's the sinful action that you take. But it's also the driving force that is part of what you and I would call our human experience. That the word, the idea of sin and the gospel that you and I know and the, the theology that you and I base our life on it points beyond just our sinful actions and then points internally to our defective internals or what we would call our sinful nature. It's the idea that we are inclined to sin, right? We're bent towards it. You're pulled towards it. You ever driven a car that the tires were just slightly out of a line? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, actually, let's not think about slightly out of line. Let's talk about like badly out of line. Like you haven't bothered to care for this car in a year. And you're supposed to be driving this way. And every time you reach for the radio or, you know, to get something to drink, what does the car do? Just right? Because the car has a natural tendency to go a certain way based on the wear of the tires. And if you're not taking care of the maintenance or holding onto the wheel, right, the car is going to naturally go there. That's kind of the idea that we're thinking right here. It's like, like it, it's supposed to go this way. That's God's design. And as long as Jesus takes the wheel, right, everything's going to be fine and go that way. But if we let go or let Jesus let go, like, man, I'm going to be in control of this, then I'm going to drink something while I'm going, that car is going to just slightly keep, to, it's going to jerk sideways, and you're going to end up in the ditch or in a mailbox or something on the side of the road where you don't want to be. It's like when you have a free moment. <laughs> it's like, I love this. I enjoy watching this. Like, if you come up to a red light, what does everybody do when they pull up to a red light? Yeah, the moment, you're, matter of fact, it's not even the moment you stop, right? But as soon as you know you're going to stop, almost everybody, watch, pay attention in a four-way. Everybody's grabbing something out of their thing, and their head goes down for a moment. And they're not praying, right? They're checking a text. <laughs> they're flipping through Facebook. And I've gotten really good at that. I can actually cover a lot of ground on Facebook in about the minute and a half that a, that a red light is, right? And I love it. Like, if I'm going to have to catch a red light, I want to catch it right as it turns red so that I have time to, like, flip through it or send a message or or something like that and not feel bad about it. But here's what happens with that. It's actually kind of funny. I attended a conference yesterday at North Park that talked about like social media and, and phones. And, and one of the things we discussed was the concept of addiction, right? That they, they have become an addiction for us. And I think that's, that's the point I'm trying to get to is you can't help it. You and I have so trained ourselves that when I have a free moment, I whip that phone out. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that at the gas station, right? I put my card in. I put the thing in. I've got it going. Then I whip my phone out. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm doing in the moment except that I have a free moment when I'm not doing something. So therefore, I have to have my phone in my hand and find something to do. That's what a bent is. That's what an inclination is. You're drawn to it. You're not even sure why you're wanting to do it, but it's like it's, you can't help it. It's just there. It's a part of who you are now. Why is that? Where does that come from when we think about sin as a nature that pulls me to something that I don't want to do and I don't even like where it's going to go, but, but I'm going anyway? Where does that come from? I guess actually we're basically asking the question of where does sin come from, which brings us to the deep, rich theology of the doctrine of original sin. 
Now in Romans 3.23, and he actually says it early in verse 9, Paul reminds us that all men, and that doesn't mean girls not, right? So all people have sinned. How is that possible? How could he possibly know that? Well, he expands on that some in chapter 5. If you were to flip over, you can look in verse 12. He says, just as sin entered the world through one man and then death through that sin, in this way death came to all people because all sin. And what he does is he starts to extrapolate and, and essentially push us back to Genesis chapter 3. Then we think about what Adam and Eve did there. Adam and Eve are doing their thing and the serpent comes up and talks to Eve and basically what you were to read if you were to go back into verse 6 specifically it says that she saw that the fruit was was good for the eye and that it was going to taste good and then it says and she desired wisdom she desired to be like God and there it is Adam and Eve then together decided they wanted to be like God they wanted the knowledge and the wisdom to be like God and then pursued that selfish desires, doing the one thing that God told them not to do, right? And in chapter 2, verse 17, he goes, you do everything. You have all the freedom that there is, but don't eat from this one tree. And they're like, oh, that's the one I want. I got to have it. And the result of that is they get kicked out of the garden, right? Childbirth is now terrible, and I spend most of my day working for nothing, and they were no longer in fellowship with God. Kicked out of the garden where God no longer walks and talks with them along their merry way, right? Disfellowshipped from the Father. And the way that Paul said it in chapter 5 verse 12 is that sin enters the world and that's how then death enters the world, right? That's the whole theology behind Genesis 3 is that we decided to do our own thing and that disfellowship to us from God brought utter corruption to us, messed everything up. And I have the problem when I think about that story because I like things to be fair. And I think about Adam and Eve and all right, they made that decision. That's totally their problem. Why am I dealing with it? Why am I having to suffer? Because Adam and Eve decided they wanted to eat the wrong fruit. They wanted the wisdom of God. I didn't want the wisdom of God. Maybe I know better and I don't want to be like that. Why is it that I, ha why, why has that become my problem and I'm somehow now being punished because of their mistake? Scripture teaches us that we're all corrupted by Adam's sin. That he was, and we can delve into this more later, but that he was like our prototype, our representative, you know, the one on behalf of the many. So when sin, when he sinned, when Eve sinned, when they knew what God wanted from them and then missed the mark, probably just by one degree. I mean, there's a tree and there's a tree and they're not supposed to eat of this one. And they did. It was so close. They were so close. But they still missed it. And when they missed that mark, we all then get corrupted and inherit their sin. And that's where your bent comes from. That's where your sinful desire that's always pulling you off course comes from, right? You inherited that corruption, so it's, it's a part of you. It's a part of who we are now. It's like our wheels are never quite aligned. And I'm always trying to go to the ditch. But there's actually an interesting thought that, that I, is a bit of good news is that we inherit the sin that comes from Adam and Eve and that rebellion. It's, it's a part of who we are. But we don't inherit the guilt of their sin. We inherit the sin, right? That inclination, that draw, that desire for something that's not supposed to be mine. But I actually don't inherit their guilt. Because all have sinned because of Adam. But God only holds you guilty for your own actions. So your sinful na your nature, who you are, has been corrupted and you are now naturally bent to sin because of them and uh, that's not cool. But your guilt is determined by your behavior. 
Your guilt is determined by you knowing the right way and then choosing to give in to the inclination. By you letting go of the will and letting life go where it wants to go on its own instead of trying and being in line with God. So that your guilt is determined by your own sinful nature. That's why next week when we look at verse 24 it says that all are justified. We don't see that as like a universal everybody gets saved. No, because you're you're guilty of your own behavior and your own actions. This brilliant theologian, Stanley Grins, put it this way. Each of us will and does sin. We all do it. Once we are in a position to reflect moral choices and actions, and thereby to act out what is present within our nature by heredity and socialization. Fancy way of saying is that we're all going to do it once we're put into a position to make our own choice. Now we can dwell on that, and I don't want to spend the time on it, but think about how that plays out like with a baby, right? Do we want a baby to be guilty of their sin? No, I'm not okay with that. And our theology tries to understand that, but a time comes in a child's life where they are then faced with moral choices and they are making their own choice. And they choose sin, and it doesn't matter, I don't know when that happens, is it three or 12? I have no idea, but I know that it happens. At some point, a human makes a moral choice on their own and guilt becomes theirs. That's what Stanley said. Is your brain hurting yet? Are you a little tired and a little confused? Me too. So let's step back and re recoup, right? Do a little rehearsal. Sin, by definition, is to miss the mark. To miss out on the, or to, to miss the expectations of God. God expects you to be this way. We were made to be perfect just like in the garden. And we miss it. And we all miss it. Because you will give in to your natural inclination. Thanks to Adam and Eve, this powerful destructive force of sin now rules in our lives. It pushes us to miss the mark. And when you do miss that mark, you become guilty of sin, deserving of death and separation and what we call hell. The bottom line is, is that we are corrupted. We're hopeless. Our fall and our guilt is essentially inevitable because you were born to go that way and you will go that way because it's who we've become. And I want us to stop and think about what that sin that is present in you, the desire, yes, and then the actual acts, yes. What does that sin that is in you do to you? What's it do to your life, like now, like right now and forever? Well, it does condemn you. You know, we're legally condemned by God. You become an object of his wrath because he doesn't like unholiness because he is perfect and is not going to tolerate that. So we deserve what comes to us, right? We deserve hell. Like that's the path we've chosen and that's what you can get. But a better way of understanding that, at least a better way for me that makes more sense is to think about how sin alienates you. That the presence of sin, this natural desire towards sin that I have, and then my choice to follow it, my choice to be sinful and this sin that that's haunts me and draws me and pulls me aside, that, that that action and that desire destroys relationships. It alienates me from really everything that's ever mattered, right? From any relationship I've ever cared about, sin destroys. The thing about God, right? Your relationship with God is destroyed or alienated because you sin because you're out of fellowship with him. You are separated from him. You are the rebellious child and he is the good and righteous father who says you're not going to act like that in my house and he kicks you out, right? And when you want to come home, right? Prodigal son, when you want to come home and repent, Jesus can cleanse you and get you back in the house. We'll pick that up next week. But that's the image is that he is perfect and you are in rebellion and your rebellion has alienated you from him. He didn't do it. You did. That sin has ruined, it's destroyed that relationship. But not just that one. Your relationship with each other. You're alienated from one another. Your relationships here are destroyed because of the sin that is present. And you think about how we, we treat one another. And this is for everything from like 
What I hear from the stories from recess, right? Martha Kate comes home and tells me these incredible stories from school, and they're fascinating, and some of them I remember, but at recess, all the way up to like nations versus nations, most human relationships, right, are defined by the pursuit of power and influence. It's this kid wanting to be cooler than this kid, right? This nation wanting to be more powerful than this nation. So we, we work and we angle and we corrupt and we do all the things that we can so that I have the power and I have the influence and I don't really care what it does to you. Then when I pursue life in that way, our relationship gets destroyed. Sin, th that's what sin is. Sin is the pursuit of that selfishness, of that power, and of that influence. And the presence of that sin in your life, what it does is it, it robs you. It robs you of dignity because you were made in the image of God. You were designed to walk with God in righteousness and holiness in the garden, right? And when you decide, no, I want to be like this, and I want to act like this, and I want to do all this other stuff and have my own way and excel in my own power, you, you've robbed yourself of the dignity of what it means to be made in God's image. And you've also destroyed the trust that you had in the person that you're in a relationship with. Think about what happens when you, you lie to your spouse, right? And I know we all do it. Hey, did you buy any candy while you're at the grocery store? No, no, I didn't. And then they find the receipt of the credit card statement, right? You tell that little lie, it doesn't really matter. And then she finds out. She's not going to trust you quite as much next time you go, right? And that's small. It's probably insignificant, right? It's just, just candy. But think about that exponentially. That every time you exercise power, or influence, or the pursuit of power or influence over someone else, not only are you ruining your dignity, but you're also destroying any trust that was there. Now, yes, it can be restored, right? Repentance and forgiveness is possible, and that's the glory of the gospel. We'll pick up on more of that later. But sin destroys that. It alienates you from God, from one another, even to creation. That our sin alienates, alienates us from the creation we were called to care for. Think about Genesis 2. What was our job? To care for the garden. To look after the animals. Remember, we got to give them their names. Like We took care of them. That was the job. And now the animals eat us. We're supposed to take care of the creation, right? We provide for the plants. I'm growing my garden and it's glorious, but I promise you some animal is going to come out of it and try to kill me one day, right? Nature itself is reacting to the sin that is present in us because instead of caring for it, we abuse it. And now we have to fear it because our sin has corrupted even the world around us. That's what sin is. Sin is the corruptive, disruptive power that literally ruins everything. Yes, it ruins your relationship with God, and that is 100% the worst part. But don't forget the, how that flows out. That it also ruins your relationship with one another, ruins your relationship with the world around you. It ruins everything. It's completely destructive. Now that I've got all that good news out of the way, I want to ask you the question. So what can you do about it? If sin is terrible, right? It's destructive. I'm kind of bent towards it like I want to do it. And I see how bad it is. I'm like, oh, I don't want that in my life, preacher. Like, what do I do about it? Now, here's why I come with the really, really bad news. Nothing. You can't do anything about it. You can't fix it. You are 100% helpless, but not 100% hopeless. Because God, who is rich in mercy, saves us. You think about what he says in literally the very next verse. Saves us through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And we're going to deep dive that into the next week, right? But I, I want to I get you the... the, the the surface of it, the tidbits of it, is that you cannot fix this by yourselves. And I cannot emphasize that enough. We want to. I want to. I want to be able to fix it and then brag to God about, look how good I am. Just like I want to fix everything at home and brag to my wife, look how good I am. But I can't fix this. It's not possible. But God, who is rich in mercy, 
can, will, and has fixed it through the redemption offered through Jesus. You got to know that through Jesus Christ, God will fix the problem that is there. He will fix the problems of the sins that are there. He will even cleanse you of the corruption and start to pull you away from that, that bent that you have. He starts to align your tires. And yeah, it takes a little while, right? But it's constantly, he's constantly realigning your tires and getting you back on the right path. And God will, through Jesus, eventually save you from hell, from what you actually deserve and the path that you have chosen. God will, through Jesus, reconcile you to himself Fixing the ruined relationship that you have through him, therefore giving you the ability to be reconciled to others. It's fascinating to think about that. That sin ruins everything. But God, through Jesus, works to ultimately fix everything. He offers you salvation from your sins. And it only comes through a relationship with Jesus. Next week, we'll dive into the theology of that. But for today, I want you to hear what Paul's going to get to in Romans 10. He tells you and he tells me that if you will declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Salvation and the cleansing of sin is offered through the life of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to fully grasp the terrible situation that we have placed ourselves in. That the sin that we not only have inherited, but have so freely embraced, it is utterly corruptive and destructive. It ruins everything I've ever loved or cared about. And the end result for me will be terrible. And it's, I think, only in the understanding of how bad that is for me that I can fully begin to grasp how good what you have done for me is through Jesus. So I ask that you would help each of us to, to, to get that, to grasp what it means to be broken and fallen and rebellious and how terrible it is for us to miss the mark even by just a little so that we can grasp how wonderful and salvific and life-changing and life-giving grace is that is given to us through Jesus. And I ask that you would help each of us, would you call and prompt each of us to hear that grace and respond to it in repentance, that you would bring salvation to our homes. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen.